So here we're checking out uh, the open source smartphone project right here at Inara Connect. And uh, hi, so who are you? <laughs> I'm uh, Todd Weaver. I'm founder and CEO of uh, Purism. So Purism right here, this is your website and you have a, a crowdfunding campaign. And something was really cool I just saw. Can you go back just a few seconds in the video? Sure. Because your, your, your open source phone is even going to be able to dock to a larger screen. Yes, the con convergence, yeah. <clears throat> and so the... Right here. Yes. The is intention, it? actually we got a video, we have a, not just a video of that, but also a, um, a uh, we have photos that we can show you. Yeah. That's the convergence. Convergence style. So um, it's uh, Debian Phone Continuum, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so PureOS, which is our operating system, is one in which is a Debian derivative uh, with a Debian upstream first uh, approach. So what we're doing is we're actually taking, forking Debian so that we can advance PureOS on our hardware and then patch everything uh, upstream back into Debian. And it, so this is running in uh, potentially in IMX8, the latest uh, uh, NXP free scale chipset, or it could be in IMX6, it depends if it's available by the time you ship, right? Yes, and correct. And you have, you have a, a lot of... Um, support already on crowdfunding. Yes, correct. This is so, your own website for crowdfunding? Yeah, so what we did, uh, we've actually done crowdfunding on a number of different websites, um, and from uh, CrowdSupply to Indiegogo, and in the end we realized that we were driving all of the traffic. Uh, and so, now that we've built up brand credibility and, and product shipment, uh, then we decided we would host it ourselves because we can then end up leveraging that, uh, the additional revenue um, from the campaign and actually provide that to the software developers who are yeah, going to improve four, it. Yeah, the four percent instead of giving it to the Indiegogo or the Kickstarter com company. And it can be anywhere from uh, uh, four percent. Sounds like you've negotiated better than I have. So it's a uh, five. It's usually five percent to anywhere up to actually around thirteen percent, depending on which levers you kind of choose within the campaign themselves. And so since we are driving. Uh, all the traffic and have the credibility behind it, then we, we are hosting it ourselves. And we've already crossed over the 50% mark, uh, which is a great milestone uh, to show that. Is it, how, it's a two month campaign? A two month, camp, two month campaign, and, and so we have 27 days left, and, we're, um, and we have to raise another $734,000. And uh, each phone, uh, if I scroll down right here, mm -hmm. can you scroll down a little bit mm -hmm. and show the. Each phone is, uh, is it $599? Yes, uh -huh. so <clears throat> the phone itself is uh, there's a dev kit for $299, and then there's a phone for $599, and, um, and that, that's going to be shipping in... Uh, so there's more than 1,000 people already ordering that one? Correct, yep. And uh, if, you have a background of doing stuff that's real, right? Because we're looking at, uh, what, are we, what is this laptop? So the laptop itself is a, this is a Librem uh, 13 version yeah. one. <clears throat> and so this one actually is one in which we had a drop down RJ45 jack. Uh, this is the version one that I've been using for about three years. So the wear and tear on this is real, uh, and it's a fantastic machine. So three All, years, you've been doing this yes. for a while now. Uh, so we started in 2014, and then uh, 2015 we built product and started shipping it. 2016 we shipped all the uh, product that had been pre-ordered. And then 2017 we now have inventory, uh, and so we're managing inventory to ship from inventory. And 2018 is going to be the year that we start developing on the phone and getting into enterprise sales more and more. So this, this, this is an Intel laptop? Correct. Uh, but it has high specs? So it's, yeah, this is actually, in th this version, uh, the one we're shipping now, I should say, uh, is a Intel uh, sixth generation, so it's Skylake. Uh, we also, because the game of freedom and the game of security and the game of privacy is always a game of depth, how deep do you go on your credibility scale. So for us, we go uh, deeper than anybody else in that we uh, run completely free software in the, uh, all of the software that runs on the machine in pure OS. And then we also go a uh, level deeper than that than the kernel doesn't have any binaries to drive the machine. And then the bootloader, of course, is free software. And then we also are running... Um, uh, core boot on these machines, and then we have a neutralized management engine, which is a layer lower. And we're working towards complete uh, management engine disablement. And at that point, then we'll have high-end new hardware that has completely free software that would qualify for the very strict standard of Free Software Foundation Respects Your Freedom certification. What is the man management engine? So the management engine uh, is a separate CPU than the main CPU that runs uh, Intel signed code 
It's designed, it initially started as a business requirement to say that, that uh, large businesses wanted to be able to remotely access a computer even when out of band or when the power's off. So they can actually connect up through Intel networking, Intel management engine on a CPUs that have Intel V Pro and be able to get lower than the BIOS level to fl flash a new BIOS version or install a new operating system, et cetera. And then that sort of took uh, off and is now in all Intel-based CPUs since 2008. Since 2008? Correct. Yes. All CPUs have vPro? All CPUs have uh, management engine binary. They don't all have vPro. So there's actually three things to do what's called Intel AMT. And this is a, a lot of people get this confused, so I'll, I'll try to summarize it in this video. There's three things to get Intel AMT. You need a CPU that has vPro, which we don't have. We use CPUs that do not have vPro. The second thing you need is you need Intel networking, which we also don't have. We use Qualcomm, Atheros, and Broadcom for the networking. So we've removed that piece. The third thing you need is a management engine binary. The management engine binary is a requirement for existing BIOS vendors, as well as even Coreboot. So what we do is we disable, or not, sorry, not disable, we neutralize the management engine and we're working towards disablement of the management engine where it doesn't even run at all. So of, of those threats, we already have removed two of them, and the third one we've neutralized and are working towards complete removal of that management engine. But Intel is just down there by down the street. Can you go and ask them to just disable it or something? So we have actually put out a petition and we have an account manager which we've submitted that petition towards and we communicate with them regularly. One of the areas that actually is really great is that we are in removing the management engine is that we're reverse engineering it to disable it. We're not actually trying to release the, so the reverse engineer and find code or release the source code to actually have a functioning management engine. We don't want it at all. So Intel is aware that this is a, a concern from a security standpoint um, and, uh, and may in future versions offer a ME-less, which is their term, an ME-less design, but uh, right now we, we don't see that. So we're going to continue to advance towards reverse engineering to disable that management engine uh, CPU. Because there was a funny kind of story in last month or so two few recently where the whole vPro stuff was kind of like uh, like cracked and hacked and Correct. all of the all yeah. of the people are right. in, in trouble. Yeah, through and the Intel guys that were behind vPro all fired or what? <laughs> I, no, I doubt it. Um, so no, the um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's, <laughs> just um, that's that's funny. Yeah. So they um, no, actually, what what the process was is that there was a an exploit against vPro, which of course is a, a fairly simple <laughs> exploit a web-based authentication exploit against uh, Intel AMT. So if somebody was running those three things I mentioned, then they uh, w were um, exploitable against that crack. Of course, our machines were not exploitable because we don't have the vPro and we don't have uh, Intel networking. Uh, and we also have a neutralized management engine. But that's just a, a highlight that there's more exploits to come, right? This is a binary. Uh, even though it's signed by Intel, there's already known uh, issues with how it was signed, the, and there's bugs, right? So this is, human error will inevitably uh, show through on the exploits. And we know that there's even going to be some discussions in some upcoming uh, Black Hat conferences about, about some more of these Intel management engine exploits. That sounds like a lot of, uh, no, I'm just joking a little bit, but a lot of uh, challenges with the Intel world. So how about you take this beautiful laptop and make it into an ARM laptop? Are yes. you talking, are you considering this? So we are actually, um, from DebConf, we've talked to a number of ARM engineers about seeing if there's enough demand to fabricate an ARM64 based laptop. And because Purism can manufacture in smaller quantities a lot because of the supply demand story within China, uh, allows us to you know, have a higher cost of unit but also be able to target some NRE, uh, higher NRE fees to fabricate in smaller quantities. So that allows us to actually have a story in which we can potentially create a brand new type of product, specifically an ARM64 in a small form factor laptop that has, actually in this case, would be a completely uh, free hardware design down to the schematic level. So we've been discussing with a number of ARM uh, developers, designers, 
Some uh, of the guys are on here. Yeah, exactly. At, at this conference yeah. is, is, a, is a key area to gather up those individuals. Because I think these guys over here and uh, me and lots of people are, I've been waiting for, maybe you will be the one to finally make it happen. Crack the issue sure. or something. Yeah, it's possible. Like where yeah. suddenly maybe you, you have the awesome arm laptop. Yeah. Running Debian on arm. Yes, right. So the again, the issue is about uh, MOQ. And the way that we work is we work in a pretty low risk uh, you know, business model where what we would do is if, if we see that there's enough demand just from talking with people in the community and then we have the ability to fabricate something in, in the quantity that we would target, then what we do is we basically put out a crowdfunding to say, is, is there enough people that are interested? And if, if there are enough people, and that number might be 500, it might be 1,000, Uh, which is not a, such a significant number, it's a, like, it's a non-starter. It just means that we have to show that there's enough demand uh, that will pre-order. And then in that case, you know, pre-ordering in a dollar amount that we know we'd be able to fabricate and still be able to, to uh, deliver on the product, then, uh, then we bring that to market. So that's something that we're in discussion with with a couple of key individuals. And if they, uh, if the kind of the numbers work out, then we'll probably be able to bring a crowdfunding product or project to market. And then hopefully within maybe six months after that, be able to see uh, an ARM64 laptop. Uh, so uh, is it public how many you sold of the, the Intel laptop so far? No, it's not, but we measure it in the thousands. We don't measure it in the thousands. Ten, ten thousands yet, right? Yeah. So we're, and we've been doubling each year. So it's been, uh, you know, fantastic growth. Uh, more and more people are getting, uh, be, being made aware uh, that security is a game of depth and you need to be able to go deep all the way into the hardware. Uh, and and purism's popping up more and more for the hardware vendor that they would want to buy from. And that goes from consumers, uh, right, uh, individual users, uh, customers, all the way to uh, enterprise sales. And so um, there's this consideration that you have, if we can scroll up to the top again, uh, sure. where you're talking about this, um, the new, the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks, looks looks pretty awesome. So, but you you, you can't just use an off-the-shelf Qualcomm or MediaTek smartphone. Yep. And why is that? Well, we evaluated pretty much everything that's out there, uh, from ODM designs to you know what we can source currently through existing suppliers like BYD, um, and and what we came out with was that in the end. All Qualcomm chips are married the CPU to the baseband, and that, from a security story, is a disaster. So, what we needed to do is evaluate what CPU options we would have that would allow us to run completely free software and have a really strong security story. That uh, fell down to basically all the way down to IMX6 or potentially IMX8, uh, because we have the ability to separate CPU from the baseband, and also because the uh, GNU support, Linux kernel support, is really good. Uh, as well as there's already a reverse engineered GPU, the Etnaviv driver that we can that we can also leverage. So then there would be uh, uh, lots of stuff coming through the IMX area and hopefully IMX8, which is a pretty cool new chipset that they have over there. Right. Hopefully they'll have it available by the time you want to ship this. Yeah. So the for us we actually put a little over a year for delivery of the phone. Most of that time is software development because this is not Android. Right. And by targeting specifically not Android, allows us to have a great future where we can have free software running on a phone as opposed to the uh, faux free software that uh, uh, Android uh, brings us with all the binaries. So, uh, so we can actually have something that is, you know, respects digital rights, which is something that I am a strong uh, b believer in. So IMX6, by having about a, a little over a year to do the software development also allows us to then delay our hardware selection where we put the stake in the ground probably six months from now when we actually get to pick the hardware that we're going to be using. So that allows us to then see does the you know, does IMX8, will, is, is it going to make it into production on time? Is there going to see delays? What are the you know, specific GPU that they're going to be using, et cetera. And then we can, uh, so we can test that out In six months from now, then we'll be putting the stake in the ground with regard to the hardware, IMX6 or IMX8. Uh, we're, and we're obviously hoping for IMX8. Can we go down a little bit on your page here? So you're talking sure. about so GNU uh, Linux uh, operating system. Uh, what's, what's this UI? You just had a, a you just showed a UI in your, in your picture there, but uh, yes. what, how are you going to make a UI that looks cool that's not Android? Um, so a couple things. Um, 
we have a bunch of quotes with regard to GNOME um, and KDE. So this is actually a KDE uh, screen running the Plasma des desktop environment. And so we have a partnership with, with KDE and we also have a partnership with GNOME. This is a, an important thing is that this isn't like desktop wars of 20 years ago, where it was you know one versus the other. Uh, we're actually creating a reference platform and are going to just support both communities. So that way we can actually see KDE on a phone as well as GNOME on a phone, depending on what the user actually would like to see. So the desktop environment and each of those uh, communities are in different states, and also where they're looking to go is uh, you know slightly different paths. So in the Right now, on the Librem laptops, we're shipping GNOME Shell, so advancing GNOME towards a phone is also a good idea, so we have a unification of pure OS. But KDE Plasma is currently has a, a functioning uh, finger-first interface that we don't see in the GNOME mobile world, which we're actually going to be investing in to, to advance. So we are going to be supporting and uh, advancing KDE uh, and, and seeing where that goes, and then also supporting and advancing GNOME to see which one's going to be the best choice for us to ship by default, but knowing that a user can also switch to the other is really important for you know the user's control. And uh, a user with their with their phone will be able to do whatever they want. Well, yes, a user who has understanding of what free software is or can you know run their own distribution. So of course the audience that that we're talking to here is probably going to be able to understand that yes, they'll be able to run their own. GNU Linux distribution, run free software, they can end up writing applications for it as well. But we're not just focusing on free software users, right? We're actually expanding to people who are concerned about security or privacy or the Google surveillance machine or the walled gardens of Apple. And so we want to break away from that and say that, you know, this is actually a machine that can respect your digital rights. And what that means at the core is it has to run free software. If, you know, if someone says that they have a privacy focused phone and you ask the question of what's the operating system and they say it's Android based, then to me, me, that's just an immediate dismissal that it doesn't actually protect your privacy or in any way is, uh, can be secure. So you have to have the free software story. Everything builds off of that. And so being able to have a convenient phone that an average user would be able to make a phone call and use in the, that respects their digital rights is our end goal is then we can end up having a platform and then more app developers can develop apps and have a platform that will be able to average users start using, similar to what we see in the desktop space and laptop space uh, in, in the free software world. And uh, your pure OS uh, can uh, have some kind of app that just runs Android apps too, right? So there is a number of areas that uh, um, that Android, being able to run Android apps in isolation or in a virtual machine um, that have, you know, that are out there already. Uh, we haven't looked at testing those or including those yet, but that is something that we're evaluating. The possibility would be then within the phone if you have a requirement for an app, similar to if if you have a requirement to run a Windows you know application uh, on our laptop, you can run boxes and then run Windows, uh, and that gets us the, our foot in the door with with the, the, that user base. The same type of thing can apply in the the phone space if there's a requirement for an Android app then it is at least possible, technically possible, we just have to advance to making that a little bit easier for the user to be able to do. So you're basically carrying around your desktop in the pocket and then you can dock it, you have a picture showing how it looks when yeah. when you do the, the yeah. convergence mode and are you planning to do uh, uh, potentially DisplayPort or HDMI through a, a USB Type-C in alt mode? <laughs> uh, you just described it, yes. Yeah, so yeah. uh, Type-C USB uh, from, the, from the phone Potentially direct to the monitor, otherwise through a through a hub, and be able to then have a docking uh, docking device as well, and then be able to support a, the phone, the touch only interface on the phone, and then have a full desktop environment on your uh, on your larger screen and keyboard mouse. Cool, awesome. So, um, uh, how many people in your company? Where are you based? And we we have about uh, eighteen full time employees. Uh, our manufacturing, we have about fifteen uh, contract assembly partners, and then we uh, do our assembly in South San Francisco, but our staff are worldwide. Um, as a matter of fact, I think th that we, we have about three, maybe four, people in the U.S. 
everybody else is uh, international. And the three, four are not even in the same like in the same office. There's not there's no. no office. So we we have our assembly office, but that's all of our assembly contractors. Um, and so we, when we bring in machines, then we do all of our testing, OS loading, configuration, shipping, all from South San Francisco. You in San Francisco? And, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. And so I'm here. Our finance person's here. Um, and we have an ops, uh, an ops person here as well, and so, then. So you're like, kind of like a little Linaro, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Because Linaro has all these guys. They are distributed all over the world. They live in all the like hundred different countries or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so you're doing something like that? Yeah. So exactly. So for me, um, it, when somebody opens up their laptop and then connects to VPN and connects to our services, at that point, then they can be working for us. So it doesn't it doesn't matter to me geolocation. Uh, we're probably arguably the most progressive hirer ever because uh, we, we will hire based off of um, a user's eagerness and understanding of free software. And so, uh, you know, we, we don't care about anything else, right? Uh, geolocation, age, gender, it does not matter to us. What we want is people that are eager to change the future for the better, and that's the people that we hire at, at, no matter where they are. Usually that's a cool... Uh, 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 what's called a, tra a slogan to have in the Silicon Valley where you want to make the future better and stuff like that. Uh, do you have a, a long background here in the Silicon Valley? What, what have you been doing before? So uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a long history in Silicon Valley. Um, actually, I, I, I even live two hours outside of Silicon Valley to sort of avoid uh, Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, so my, my history is really around disrupting giants. Um, so before starting Purism, I actually launched the first online cable company uh, with the business model that we were going to be sued by the largest media companies in the world. Uh, and But we were paying royalties and believed we were on the right side of the law. They just had more money and stronger lawyers. So uh, that? that was called Ivy, spelled I-V-I. Yeah. Um, and that was about 2007 time frame. And so we, we lasted about nine months in the court system and then were shut down. And, cable uh, company, that means yeah. uh, TV channels over yes. the web. Yeah, exactly. We had 72 uh, television stations that you could watch uh, from an application that you could download. And Why it was... Why is that not allowed? Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, boy. No, YouTube I need TV an entire that. another video I need to, for that topic. Um, so it's, uh, it's not allowed. In short, is that the regulatory system and the monopolies that the cable, system, the cable companies currently uh, have so it's a, I mean it's a it's a government provided monopoly into a specific location and what they have is then they negotiate for the rights to redistribute the channels um, and so it really is uh, it's just you know giant corporations uh, strangle holding on on what the users actually want and users of course what they want in the television market is they want transparency and freedom of choice. Cutting the cable. Yeah, right. But, but cutting Watching the cable the allows internet. you... To, yeah, correct. And, and doing that, uh, so uh, what, what Ivy was doing, which is a complete, another separate video, but in short, what I was doing was I was disrupting the cable industry saying, users should be able to choose their individual channels and pay for just those channels, which allowed for then individuals to say, I want to vote with my wallet. Right now in the cable market, you can't vote with your wallet. You pick tiers, you can't pick channels. So by definition, you're paying for a lot more channels than you actually want. And the end result is everybody wants 10 channels. Everybody wants just a different 10 channels. So by offering transparency and individual channel selection allowed for us to actually have people vote with their wallet and, and then create good content. That just doesn't happen. So the entire US television market uh, in 2007, I explained that it's gonna be a decade before we can actually get good live streaming television. Uh, and here we are 2017 where it's starting to happen. One thing that th I think is really strange, and I'm European, you know, when I come to the US and I try to watch TV, it's very hard, because mm -hmm. basically it's advertising all the time. Mm -hmm. yes, How right. can people stand this? Uh, well, you know, a lot of the youth can't. So the trends are, uh, the, the youth have cut the cord. I mean, like cutting the cord to me is already, you know, a thing of the past. If you watch a people, TV show, it's yeah. like interrupted 10 times. Yeah, so they don't... How is that okay? So it's not. And that's also why the the you know market is showing that it's not okay, right? So that's why a lot of the youth are you know streaming videos online. They're, you know, they're almost consuming all of their entertainment online. And, uh, and, this, and that same type of story applies to actually what we're trying to do with the phone even by having an IP first phone is that phone providers now are, you know, they're like 
cutting the cord from a phone provider is like the next frontier of cord cutting. Will be then we can actually say, you know what, I, I want you to be a dumb pipe. So my, my approach to all ISPs is they should be dumb pipes that just give us internet. They can still make money being and dumb. Pipes. That's right, you can, make, you can make, make your money off of providing the, the data connection and then all services should be over the top. And so that's what I, I was an over the top video provider and now we're gonna be an over the top IP first uh, phone provider. And so being able to then say that a user can make a, you know, an IP call and control the, the encryption stack and control the software to be able to make that call is actually important. And so this is where my belief is phone, the, the service providers should be dumb pipes across the board. So I've heard about some, some, some kind of like uh, uh, pot potential ways to do electronic SIMs and you would arrive in a country and you can just choose your provider, you don't even need a SIM card, are you gonna do some, or that's too much? No, uh, it's too much for the initially when we launch, but, but we're laying the foundation for that exact thing to be able to happen. So with software development, that would be able to happen. So the hardware would be able to support it. So what that means is having the ability to support multi, uh, you know, um, technology stacks and multi-communication, so then you can walk in and then be able to switch it. The switching is actually, in that case, the software. Um, and then be able to uh, to do all sorts of uh, like then then sort of the sky's the limit right where we can actually do uh, you know Wi-Fi only so you can have completely no carrier and then you can actually tether to other people and have complete net mesh networks right all that stuff becomes where being able to have hardware and then a software freedom to be able to do that is is then we can really start to see an awful lot of innovations. Like 10 years ago, I think uh, Larry Page was doing a speech in Washington saying we want white spaces, but nothing happened. Uh, like yes, there's still right. no mm -hmm. white spaces. Uh, yeah. I think that that would be a cool thing if people could have a little white space rotor at home, mm -hmm. share with like a kilometer, I, I counted kilometers, sorry, mm -hmm. a That's kilometer fine. around their home and then uh, you would have a few, a thousand people and the whole city is covered yeah, right. with free bandwidth. Mm -hmm. That would be cool, right? Yeah, but then you, absolutely. Need, you yes, need another right. kind of modem in that phone. Well, so there's actually a few a few options that can solve that, and, but we need to you know we need to increment towards there. So there are uh, existing frequencies that are in the public domain. They're just smaller frequencies, right? So you, not as far distances. Uh, but that those larger, high-powered ones are available. And if I could pick, I would say disband all all broadcast television, which is yeah. should just go away, especially because they sued me. So they should all just go away. And then what we should do is use that baseband, that, that uh, frequency, for uh, open internet connection. So then you can just simply connect and be able to, um, to communicate online everywhere. But the baseband so, you, you might have in the phone might be able to support that 700 megahertz baseband that might be the old digital TV? Yeah, uh, well, absolutely. That, that's just uh, hardware the selection. Analog right? TV. And so, so being able to have a chip that actually supports that is, is if we started to see that that frequency was going to become available, then we can start advancing towards that. Then we start seeing some really amazing things. So, it, so early on, we can start where, yes, maybe you're, we start having routers, and this, there's a lot of movements towards this, where you have routers that actually have an, uh, an open section, right? So if you pass by, you can connect up, right? Um, open net and a few other things. Fawn, so there was something called Fawn once. Oh, maybe, okay. Yeah. And so, so that type of thing is helpful, but then by actually having a phone that allows like auto tethering and a few other pieces, then we can start creating these mesh networks. Um, and, and that would also be helpful in emergency situations where we see cell towers dropping, but we can have you know a, a strong network connection somewhere and then be able to Bluetooth or Wi-Fi connect a mesh network around. So there's a lot of really amazing things that we can happen, but all of them depend on, at the root of it, it needs to be hardware that can run free software so that we can actually advance those causes. So when I look at your open source uh, laptop right mm -hmm. here, uh, is this the most open source laptop project in the world? Uh, no, if you have pre-2008 hardware, then you actually can get that the last remaining bit that we don't have freed yet, which is um, to have core boot without binaries. Uh, so post-2008, this is the most secure and free software laptop available because we actually have core boot and a, and a neutralized management engine. But the other thing is that by supporting us on the hardware side, then we are investing in those software developers to continue to dig deeper. And so we're going to be coming out with more and more announcements about the, you know digging that layer lower, uh, 
getting towards that disablement of the management engine, and then starting to work on other areas that are, uh, that are equally as important uh, from a free software story. When you talk about the Skylake, uh, do you have Core i7, do you have the 8th generation, do you, do you, is sure. there any chance to be getting that kind of stuff? Or? Yeah, so right now this is the uh, in the Librem 13 and Librem 15, we have uh, Intel i7 6th uh, generation, which is Skylake. Uh, seventh generation we brought in to start evaluating and and so we're going to continue to stay not bleeding edge but you know current on the hardware part of that is because we of course have to do software development effort to making sure core boot works properly and is actually productized for that uh, for that specific hardware so we'll be staying you know if you're if you're buying from us you'll always be on the you know on the, in the current hardware realm but not uh, bleeding edge and uh, doing something like that is not necessarily that easy, and maybe there's some, there could be some issues sometimes, and uh, how do you manage all the potential issues that might happen? Yeah, so if you look back at our history, you'll see that we've managed through a lot of those issues, primarily around uh, 4K screens, try, trying to get 4K screens in our devices at what would have been the leading edge of that um, uh, trend. But you know, uh, the suppliers who were buying 4K screens were buying them buying them all up so I couldn't source them and then that saw delays in our supply chain so what we've and a lot of that's just learning the process of what we can and cannot do in the supply chain so we know what we source we know what we can manufacture we know what we can modify and we advance those causes and then the areas that we want to move even you know deeper and deeper are uh, that we can start negotiating with the supply chain so we've, we've learned a lot awful lot so as it relates to your question about uh, you know, Skylake versus, let's say, Cabby Lake, is that we have Cabby Lake in-house that we're testing right now. Uh, most of that testing that we've shown is that it works across the board at the higher levels, but we need to get Core Boot running, and then we also have to test the management engine version against that to see if it can get us to the same state. So, so how we manage that is by having developers on staff that are uh, that are testing out that hardware to make sure it meets the the strictness that we have. And, but then the after sales support kind of potential, just if somebody drops a phone and they want it repaired, mm -hmm. what do they do? So in the case of the, the phone, which will actually be the same as where we're at with the laptops now, which is that we have um, online, so we have online support and then we have warranty repair. So it'll be a one year parts and labor warranty. Uh, currently it has to ship either to uh, South San Francisco or to uh, Germany where we have a German reseller. Uh, and we're looking to expand those locations. Uh, and so that's the warranty repair process for any of the devices that we have. Potentially, you could have some extra warranty kind of things. People can pay extra and they can have like Correct. super we, warranties yes, and we, stuff. We, yes, we have a three-year extended warranty option yeah. that people can, can certainly uh, look into. And so this is an area that, you know, initially we know and we're not trying to, you know, grow too fast because uh, you know, and let's say try and create a bunch of retail stores, right? That would be a, a, a nightmare. So what we're looking to do is grow organically, and we have a long-term uh, goal that we're trying to meet, which really, at the end of the day, comes down to protecting and having secure devices around digital rights and, and making sure that digital rights can actually mirror physical rights. And it, that is where, if a, in the future, a kid ends up using our phone because their parents wanted them to use a phone that was secure and protected them, uh, then I feel like, like we're actually making an impact and a change in the future of computing. And if this really works out super successful, super great, you could have a lower cost versions maybe later? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the thing is that there are volume discounts, which we are not taking advantage of. So right now we pay more Per, per, per unit because we're doing smaller quantities and we have an NRE fee, we're trying to make change in the hardware level. But as we start to see our growth, then we can start purchasing in volume and then obviously start to see volume discounts. We've already seen one volume discount, which we've, uh, we've been able to lower our prices um, a few hundred dollars per unit based off of that alone. And then we can see that start to, you know, hopefully kind of have a snowball effect where it'll grow and grow and grow and we can start having uh, less expensive uh, product. And uh, this is going to be a 5-inch? 
display. The, the phone is going to be a five inch display, correct. And if people want six inch, they, they can hope for the future that can be different yes. versions, right? Right, and so we're actually toying with somewhere within the five inch range, it might actually be five and a half. Uh, it could be pushing towards a six inch size. Um, we've actually evaluated a, a series of them. Uh, the existing phone case that we were looking at, plus the battery, uh, we didn't look at anything that was in the six inch range, but that's... Um, with all the new modern displays, they do kind of like bezel less, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can fit more screen with less, it depends. You yeah, right, see. no, that's right, it does, it does depend. So right now, what we knew we'd be able to do was a five inch. Anything uh, above that, there's some benefit in the size that, in the sense that we can actually have more real estate space to put, uh, you know, IMX six or eight motherboard and peripherals, uh, and have a larger battery. But on the other hand, it also comes down to screen, screen resolution, battery life, which are also some considerations with the larger screens. Are you planning to take people's biometrics and like scan fingers and eyes and faces and all these kinds of things? Uh, no, for a number of reasons. I'm not against uh, sp specifically biometrics as one measurement of authentication, but I am against it as a single measurement of authentication. So. Um, so, and this really comes down to uh, actually precedent in the United States Supreme Court that shows that biometrics, uh, you actually are not protected. Uh, so if, if your device needed to be compromised or taken or uh, gathered up against your will, um, that biometrics is not enforceable. Um, so what that means is that your fingerprint or face can be used to unlock your device. Uh, it, the Supreme Court has shown that uh, having a code or something that's in your brain, like a passphrase or a simple code, is something that you can protect against, right? Something you can you can also change, right? So you can't change your face and you can't change your fingerprint, but you can change a passphrase and you can change a you know, passcode. So in that case, uh, the our devices are going to to be defending the privacy and digital rights of users. In that sense, we will always have some method that is the most protective of that of that user's device. So in that case, it would be a passcode or passphrase initially. If the user wants an additional, let's say, fingerprint or some biometric as a second layer, then that's something we can consider, but certainly not going to be the default um, authentication. So potentially, there could be a fingerprint reader on the back, maybe. There, there could be, but that that is really going to come from user feedback. So initially, we have no, I mean, actually, I don't even think a single person has asked for any type of biometric uh, in our hardware campaign to date. So the only way we would be looking at doing that is if an enterprise said they wanted that as a second form of authentication, and then a user can decide, do they want that or not? And then I feel like that's actually good, having the user choice, right? Uh, because I actually do feel as though a fairly strong security story would be uh, having one layer of biometric and a second authentication that's user control. So then you, you know, it, that would be equivalent to, in the worst case, the single layer of, of passcode or passphrase. So I'm thinking if there's a Swiss bank right now with 10,000 uh, customers that want to make, a, like they should just contact you, say what they want, and you could do it. Yeah, correct. Or so some kind so, of yeah. enterprise that would like right. to have security, mm -hmm. that don't trust the big Google or the big Apple, yes. and, and that uh, that have some kind of, let's say, it could be banks or anything that, mm -hmm. that have some kind of important requirement for security. Yeah, absolutely, so we actually, uh, oddly enough, are in discussions about uh, custom enterprise modifications. And so, um, and what's great is that for us, they need to be aligned with our belief system, and, but our belief system is the core to any type of really strong security story. So what the Free Software Foundation stands for ends up being the only credible security story in the end. And so what's, what's great about that is that the, if there were somebody who was listening to this video and they said, well, you know, we have an MOQ that's greater than a thousand, and what we want is this customized piece, uh, then we're, we're probably the best option uh, for them to actually see that come to fruition. As it relates to the phone, is that right now in the phone campaign, we are accepting you know, information from users and what they'd like to see, because we're in the design phase, and then we've also left enough time that the software development piece, when that's underway, we are gonna then finally make the hard, final hardware decisions on what we're gonna fabricate. So now's a good time to, you know, to voice with by backing the campaign and letting us know what you'd like to see. Cool, that's that's really awesome. So, looking forward to a, a pure future, right? <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, right. There's a there's a, 
no coincidence in naming the company Purism, which obviously is towards a purist approach to software, to software freedom, to you know having it where uh, we have an ethical you know future uh, as it relates to computing.